What gets called good is different if you happen to be in one society or one historical period and in another. Now that seems like the shocking claim that it's all relative, right? That's where Nietzsche's supposed to be so abominably bad for a real humanistic education, that it's all relative. Well, this is never, this is not a part of the argument. What Nietzsche is trying to show is that knowledge, truth, objectivity, and good and bad have conditions for possibility. And those conditions for possibility change. That doesn't destroy what seems to be someone who lives in the Victorian period's right to call someone a sinner. In fact, it's a condition for the possibility of them doing it. You see what I mean? It's not that everything is relative. It's that there are conditions within which evaluations take place that themselves require analysis. In other words, his account is not a moral theory, but it is a theory about how we have come to have the moral theories we do have, how we've come to have the ones that we do have. Uh, Freud paid a, a tremendous compliment uh, to Nietzsche. Freud said that Nietzsche knew more about himself than any other human had ever known or was ever likely to know. F fairly smart guy, I guess. Nietzsche was very bright. Uh, his main target was Christianity, and I'm going to, to now, we're going to return to a more contemporary uh, uh, critique of Christianity. And I in this lecture, I'm going to present a little bit of Nietzsche's critique of Christianity. And the reason I'm going to do it and how it's connected with my earlier remarks is to this very day, in spite of the so-called secularization of the world, uh, values, especially in the United States, in our culture, and again, we're working for a theory of the present, are still, by and large, Christian, by and large, Christian values. Those are the official public ones, right? the official public values. Again, the gap between how they're practiced and what they are, it's all a matter of dispute. But this, the, uh, going out of the discourse of Hegel, there are other cri uh, critiques, uh, as I say, Nietzsche's this one. He focuses on the values that surround Christianity. Uh, so I'm going to talk about him a little bit more now, and then in the next lecture I want to talk about a Christian who has a criticism of modern Christianity. So you'll get both sides. You'll get one guy who's sort of, you, you'll, you'll know before I'm through here, uh, thinks Christianity was a, a mistake. From the standpoint of the species, it was a mistake. We're, uh, he goes, well, not quite, you know, a 2,000-year mistake. I mean, it was more than that. It was a little bit more catastrophic. Uh, uh, Nietzsche thinks that, that uh, among the other ill effects of Christianity, uh, is it one, one of them is very banal. It's the habit of bad reading. He explains how many of us are raised in churches where when we bother to read, now this won't hold for many of our Jewish friends or people who believe other religions, but in the Christian tradition, we're taught to read the Old Testament where every stick of wood, every stone, every snake, every bird, every bat is a sign of Jesus. And Nietzsche points out that this inculcates in us habits of bad reading. It does. And, you know, if you think about it, he says, well, now, you know, in that book there, and then, then, the, then the, the preacher reads some just unintelligible piece of the Old Testament, you know, the locusts have no king, they fly with religion, and that means Jesus is coming. And you go, mm, yeah, okay. Nietzsche says this makes you not read well. <laughs> the being, the being brought up this way tends to make you not read well. Uh, it's worse than that, however, and that's that what the way Christianity presents itself is as a doctrine of love and compassion. Certainly that has something to do with its appeal to our national character. And that's good, to a doctrine of love and compassion. Nietzsche's concern in this book, The Genealogy of Morals, is to show that what's beneath that mask of love and compassion is really a doctrine of resentment and hatred. And I think I can make that come alive for you with some pretty banal examples. One would be uh, uh, Jerry Falwell, who uh, discusses homosexuals. He loves them. How many people believe he really loves them? See, I don't. I think he hates them. His way of hating them is to love them. 
That's the trick Nietzsche was after. The trick about how resentment, envy, and hatred can be masked with these words, love and compassion. It's an important argument today because I think we've become a suspicious culture. Nietzsche's been called one of the masters of suspicion. Paul Ricoeur, the philosopher, called him a master of suspicion. Uh, Ricoeur is a Christian as well. He just thinks that w reading these books is the mediation through which any modern kind of faith would have to pass. You'd have to read them, understand them before you'd know what you meant by having faith. In any case, Nietzsche sees this dynamic of resentment and envy as being, as it were, the unspoken or the, the, the code beneath the code of Christianity. And so for the first time in the, the course, I'm going to pull out a section of a book that I want to look at, if I can find the correct quote here. This is from the Genealogy of Morals. Uh, in this edition, it's on page 48. It's section 15 of the first essay. Uh, Nietzsche's discussing uh, Christian love, as it were, and faith, and hope. Nietzsche, in his rather cynical way, says, in faith in what? In love of what? In hope of what? These weak people, some day or other, they too intend to be strong. Have you ever heard an evangelist and got that feeling that while they were real meek, someday they intended to be real strong? That's the idea. There is no doubt of that because they say their kingdom is coming. They term it the kingdom of God because, after all, one should be so humble in all things. To experience that kind of duplicity, one needs to live a long time. Dante, I think, committed a crude blunder when, with a terror-inspiring ingenuity, he placed the gateway of his hell the inscription, I too was created by eternal love. At any rate, there would be more justification for placing above the gateway to the Christian paradise and its eternal bliss, the inscription, I too was created by eternal hate, provided a truth could be written above the gateway to a lie. What constitutes the bliss of this paradise? Well, Nietzsche goes on to quote, not Jerry Falwell, but St. Thomas Aquinas, great teacher, saint, certainly knew more about Christianity than I do or, or most, of, most of us. Uh, Thomas Aquinas says that the blessed in the kingdom of heaven will see the punishments of the damned in order that their bliss be more delightful for them. At that moment in Nietzsche's text, something sort of creepy should come up your back. You should go, St. Thomas Aquinas said that in heaven, our chief bliss would be that we could see all those mean people that got us while we were alive, having all that stuff ripped off of them eternally, forever. And Nietzsche's text wants to bring alive for us the barbarism, the hatred, that must be buried in such a doctrine of love as its core. It's a very frightening argument, but it isn't limited, and I don't want to limit it, to a set of Christian values specifically, but to certain duplicitous ways in which words of value are used in general. The way 